This is Inside the Jungle, episode 197, recorded June 3rd, 2015. Peter King's Cray Cray. Video bandwidth for Inside the Jungle is made possible by the support of our Patreon campaign. Help support Inside the Jungle today at spnt.tv slash Patreon, where for just $10 a month, you can get a free Inside the Jungle t-shirt. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are around the world. It's Inside the Jungle. We're back. It's another Wednesday night roundtable here live at cincyjungle.com. And guess what? The Fearsome Foursome are back. Yay, golf clap. We can do golf clap for that. We're all back this week talking Bengals. Does it get any better than this? I'm Nick Suberling. Glad you could join us again here on Wednesday night. Let's welcome in the man who's been MIA the last, oh gosh, it feels like forever. Mickey Menser. What's up, buddy? I have been off the grid a little bit. I'm I'm happy to be back, although it's a short stint. Nick, I'm going to miss the next couple. Uh, it's cool to be back in here talking about the Bengals. We're glad to have you back, and uh, I'm really excited to get your take on the one uh, one and only Terrell Pryor, which we'll uh, we'll talk about that here in a bit. Let's also welcome back, uh, fresh off his stay out of the country, Anthony Casenza. What's up, AC? I'm intercontinental, Nick. You know this about me. I'm I'm very cosmopolitan, but uh, good to be back. Uh, sorry I missed last week. Uh, good to chat with everybody, though. It was the best show of the year, and it was because Scott Because I was on it. Well, right. my, uh... <laughs> and, uh, of course, we're glad you're back as well, AC. We missed you. Uh, Scott Bantel, beam me up. What's up, dude? What's happening? Good to have everyone back on the show tonight. Yeah, it's going to be a good show. I'm really looking forward to uh, to catching up with everybody and uh, talking a little Bengals. Again, we'll uh, we'll open up the phone lines a little bit later on in the program to get your thoughts, Bengals fans. But uh, as always, we'd love to hear from you in our chat room as well. All right, Mickey, uh, fill us in. Terrell Pryor's the Bengal man. How do you feel about that? Um, I feel like you're always super excited for me to say something very insightful when a former Buckeye becomes a Bengal. Well, you're our Buck. You're a resident Buckeye, you know. Yeah, but man, once they once they leave, I that 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 connection I have it it severs a little bit. So I don't know. I think he's a camp body. I don't know that he's necessarily going to offer anything, but I guess it's cool to have another Buckeye on the roster. A couple weeks ago on the program, Scott threw out this conspiracy theory. I don't know if you had a chance to hear it, Mickey. He said. He thinks this is the Bengals setting themselves up for 2016 uh, and letting go of Dalton and possibly A.J. McCarron and, and moving forward with Terrell Pryor. Any legs to this? I'd say that's a that's a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> Nick, I'd like to clear. I'd like to clarify that. I, okay. I did not say that. I thought that it was setting up for the letting go of Dalton. I said it set up for the possibility that if they wanted. To go that route, they could. I don't. I don't think it will happen. I, I don't think prior. Right. That's why. Yeah. That's why we said it was but, a conspiracy theory. Right. But I, I think it is. He. I think he was brought in for an insurance policy if they would decide to go that way. Um. I. I just. I just don't see Pryor doing enough to earn a starting position. Uh, um. You know, he might. He might be that quarterback that makes a few plays with his legs that gets the fans screaming. Um, you know, hey, we need we need uh you know him to to start over Dalton, but I I don't know that he's the caliber of quarterback that you know the Bengals current starter is. So I think you'd be taking a huge step backwards if that was your long term plan. AC, you got anything to add to that? Not really. I was on the show when we first kind of started kicking around the idea. I mean. Basically, you're looking at a bigger and possibly more athletically gifted Josh Johnson. So um, uh, I, I don't really see him making a huge impact. If the Bengals end up keeping three quarterbacks, he could be that third guy. Um, from some rumblings, A.J. McCarron has been impressing, though it's been a, with backups and against backups and, and fringe roster guys. So you, you can kind of take that with a grain of salt a little bit. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't really see the Bengals keeping three quarterbacks this year just because there's a log jam at so many other positions, and I think they really like uh, McCarron, and they're they're set to stick with Dalton. I mean, there, there could be a change at that position a year or two down the road if Dalton falters, but 
Um, it could be McCarran. It could be someone completely different that we don't have any idea of. And I, I don't really see Pryor being the Bengals' starting quarterback, barring something completely unforeseen. Well, speaking of the Bengals' starting quarterback, I, I think we could put to rest the fact that Terrell Pryor is not going to be your starter. I mean, it's pretty obvious Andy Dalton's the guy moving forward. But there was an interesting article this week uh, by our good friend, <laughs> I say that jokingly, Peter King, and he ranked the Bengals as the third best team in the AFC North, and he's basically blaming Andy Dalton for uh, for this. Uh, and I'm, I'm reading his quote here, the running game and the offensive line should be enough to make up for Andy Dalton if he struggles, but I don't think a team can be great unless its quarterback is close to great. Dalton didn't necessarily lose the game, he just failed to win it. Without wideout A.J. Green, actually this is uh, from Robert Klemko at Sports Illustrated, Dalton didn't necessarily lose the game, he just failed to win it. Without wideout wide out A.J. Green and tight end Jermaine Gresham in uniform, the Bengals planned to run the ball early and often, and Indianapolis had an answer. Perhaps Colts outside linebacker Eric Walden summed it up best in the postgame locker room when he said, we just felt like we'd stop the run and see if Andy Dalton can beat us, and that's just not Andy. Um, your, your take... AC, on, on what Peter King had to say and, and what he's offering as far as the Bengals being third in the AFC North, I mean, we could talk about Dalton until we're blue in the face. I mean, that, that story is what it is. Um, but I, I'm, I'm actually more surprised that he's got the Bengals third in the AFC North. It's kind of the broken record, not only with Peter King, but with the Bengals and Andy Dalton over the past few years. You know, it's talented, but the quarterback's the liability. And they've got talent elsewhere, but they can't win the big game. And, and uh, a lot of that is true but I think there's also an overlooking of the Bengals because of the decorated history of the Pittsburgh Steelers and, and even though they're a young franchise, the Baltimore Ravens. So um, I, I don't know. I, I kind of – Peter King tends to be very critical of the Bengals. I don't know if there was some animosity. We, we've kind of touched on this before. I don't know if there's some weird animosity he holds um, from his time covering the Bengals and, and the ownership. I, 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 that's kind of my own conspiracy theory, I guess. But um, – I think, as it is, every year as you go into the season, you're going to see the Bengals always kind of take a back seat to the Ravens and the Steelers, even though you know the, the teams maybe split the series or they all have 10 wins in a year or whatever the case may be. That's just kind of what's going to happen. And until the Bengals kind of shine on those big stages and win those big games, that's going to kind of continue to be the stigma. I do think that if the Bengals are able to use the run, play some better defense than they did down the stretch last year, and maybe Andy Dalton channels a little bit of the, of the uh, Russell Wilson, if you will, maybe making some clutch passes but not so much rely on Andy Dalton only. You know, if they, if they really rely on the running game and that defense and Andy Dalton plays some safe and smart football, then you're going to see a very deep run by this Bengals team. But, you know, we say that, We've, we've been saying that for the past few years, and it just really hasn't come to fruition yet. How about you, Scott? I mean, I I, I got to admit, after watching Baltimore a year ago, um, I, I'm shocked to see them ranked higher than the Bengals, according to Peter King. Um, but look, I mean, we've talked about this before ad nauseum, that the, the division itself is absolutely brutal. It's by far the best division in football, and... You know, third place in the best division in football. I don't know. That's not not so bad. But again, I'm very surprised that he's got the Bengals below Baltimore. Maybe Pittsburgh only because they did win the division a year ago, but they they b barely won the division. It came down to the last game, the last quarter of the last game. So your your thoughts on on the ranking from from Peter King? Not not surprised. I mean, I think it's the same tired storyline. I think, you know, regardless of what the Bengals do until they make some sort of a deep run, especially from a national media perspective, they're always going to be put behind Pittsburgh and Baltimore. Pittsburgh and Baltimore are, are always put up there as one and two on reputation alone. I think if you take a look at the rosters of these teams, you'd be crazy to say that Pittsburgh or Baltimore have a better roster than the Bengals. I mean, you're, you're talking about a Steelers defense that, that lost um, – I know they weren't playing well, but they lost a lot of pieces in Palomalu and um, uh, who was it, Worldist that retired. And I mean, they've lost a lot from that defense. That's not the Steelers' defense. I've mentioned Dick LeBeau. Dick LeBeau, right? Um, Ike Taylor. Um, so, I mean, you're not talking about the same team. You look at the Ravens' offense. I mean, 
you drafted a guy in the first round that dropped 13 or 14 percent of his passes in college. Um, you know, so I'm not I'm not that threatened by their offense. They don't have a tight end. Who's their running back? I mean, you know, it's really just reputation that that people have Baltimore and Pittsburgh above the Bengals. And you know, the the Dalton storyline, it's it's just I don't know. It's tired storyline. I think it's just downright lazy reporting. I know you're a big fan of Peter King, right, Mickey? You got that OU connection? Peter King's a freaking idiot. <laughs> um, I mean, and he's back. It, it's just it, he's the same tired windbag that I, mean, I just can't stand him. And uh, it's not just because he'll bash the Bengals or whatever. I mean, this is going to be the same moron that takes three of his weekly columns to talk about his you know NFL season predictions when we all know he's picking the Patriots to win it all. He does it every year. He's he's wants to personally check Tom Brady's balls for inflation. I know he does. <laughs> so he, his storylines are so freaking tired. Um and and anyone any I'm going to say this right now. Anyone that that blames Dalton for the Bengals lack of playoff wins solely like they do and like a million fans do, like I just flipped the switch like you're off because you don't know what the heck you're talking about. The defense is freaking terrible in the playoff games, especially in this last one. There was we had no one on offense. All, all both our running backs are hurt. But yeah, it's Dalton. Um, like you, you can't expect a court. Like we've had, we've talked about this so much. But you can't expect a quarterback to be what he's not. And Dalton is surrounded by the perfect cast to win if that perfect cast plays well, and you know everyone's healthy. It hasn't happened. Um, you know. I think the Colts game, everyone was hurt. The the, the Chargers game, uh, we gave up 200 yards rushing. Uh, it's it, it's it's idiotic to say you know the Bengals are where they are because of Dalton. That's just a cop out. That's a weak storyline. Like tell tell me about you know how the Ravens have improved or how the Steelers are going to weather the storm with all the people they lost because last year's storyline was. It wasn't the Bengals were no good because of Dalton. You know, some people said that, but they lost both coordinators. They weren't going to be any good. They're, like, there's always something that they want to throw out for the Bengals, and they can't accept the fact that the Bengals make the playoffs uh, every every season. So, I don't know. I, I can't stand Peter King. I think a lot of the national media is that same way, so I, I just turn them off. I like what Cody in the chat room has to say. You know, he, he's screaming, coaching. Coaching adjustments, Mickey, and I know you've talked about that as well in these playoff uh, appearances. That there's no, that's the common thread here. I mean, it's not just Andy Dalton. Carson Palmer's playoff appearances were were dreadful as well, and that wasn't all on him. I mean, the defense didn't show up in those games either. You're, you're right. The Bengals have made the playoffs six of the last ten years, and Dalton hasn't been here the whole time for those losses. So you know, there, there's other things that go into it. But sure, yeah, we can blame one guy, and then if we do. Get rid of that guy. Half the fan base is going to be ecstatic. And then who's going to be the quarterback? And when they struggle, what's going to be the next one-player excuse? Because it's not a one-player game. You were kind of shaking your head there as well, AC, when uh, when we mentioned the coaching. Right. I mean, I think that's something that kind of has to play into the equation, the, the whole organizational culture, the coaching staff, all of that. I mean, the Bengals have done... Uh, have kind of done a 180 since the 90s under Marvin Lewis. And the, <laughs> the funny thing is, is when they get to the playoffs or these big primetime games, they look like the Bengals of the 90s instead of the Marvin Lewis Bengals that you see throughout most of the regular season. It's it's a really weird, ironic twist of fate that you kind of see with this team. So um, I maybe that's where King has kind of taken this. And, I, again, I think it's maybe um, – betting on, I guess, King maybe betting on some house money or some credit that those teams have kind of built up over the years and the Bengals have not. Uh, I, I still, there, there was another article this week, Nick, that uh, Bucky Brooks of the NFL Network, who was, I think, an NFL scout or executive and now writes for, the, for NFL.com, he wrote the top 10 best rosters in the NFL, excluding quarterbacks, and the Bengals still were not that, on that list. And it's kind of funny to me because the quarterback position was the one thing that supposedly was holding this team back and everyone else is and every every position and everyone else is doing well it's the quarterback and he excludes the quarterback and the Bengals still aren't one of those top 10 rosters in the league so either us as fans and people who and all of us who cover the the Bengals for the website 
kind of overvalue this roster and overvalue the talent that are on this roster, or the talking heads that are national that are kind of on the national scene don't really look as hard into what you see on this roster and some of the talent they've built up over the years. I think we're also a little bit biased in our we've got a little uh, tunnel vision when it comes to the Bengals and we, we feel that this roster is pretty talented. They've done a great job over the last six or seven years in the draft. There's no question about that. And it's one of the younger teams uh, in the league. In fact, they lead the NFL in players on the roster that were drafted by that team. I mean, it's and it's not even close. I think the next closest team is Seattle with 32. The Bengals have 37. Um, that, that tells you that they've done well and they've done their homework in the draft. Mark Young in the chat room, Scott, said Joe Montana couldn't win against the Colts in that playoff game uh, if he was quarterbacking the Bengals. I mean... Everybody was injured. We, we've banged on that topic a, a lot as well. But it still comes down to me, uh, you know, the, the common thread is the coaching and the lack of adjustments. And that, you know, that's the, the thing with this Peter King article that I take issue with is that nobody's really pointing fingers at Marvin Lewis here. Um, he's the one who's 0-6 in the postseason. <laughs> um, I, I'm surprised there was no mention about that. Yeah, I mean, I take a lot of issue with it. And the, the problem is, is that, stupidity breeds stupidity and when articles like this come out it just breeds more um, stupidity when it comes to Andy Dalton I you know there's an article out today from cover 32 from the Bengals uh, cover 32 site um, which you know they come out with some articles that I, that I don't quite agree with but this one was about dumping Dalton and you know it mentions in there his contract which is a, another old argument which you know, people people harp on his contract, his 96 or 100 whatever million dollar contract. It, take a look at where it ranks in the NFL. It's 16th. Where would you rank Dalton as quarterbacks in the NFL? Somewhere right in the middle, around 16. I mean, he's being paid. He, he's performing exactly, you know, what we say he is. He, he's around an average quarterback. That, that's what he's being paid as. He's being paid as an average quarterback. And, you know, Mark brings up a good point. Joe Montana couldn't have won that game. I mean, look, you got Rex Burkhead out there. You got Greg Little, and you got Muhammad Sanu. His tight end was uh, Kevin Brock. Kevin Brock. Right. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it might as well have been a no-name guy. I mean, I, I mean, he didn't stand a chance. Uh, you know, we all were hopeful that he would, but you know, he didn't stand a chance. So. Um, to blame these games on Dalton, either you're not watching the games or you just don't know football. You know, this is a defense that in these four losses has averaged about 150 to 160 yards on the ground per game. You know, they haven't been able to touch the quarterback. Like Mickey said, halftime adjustments. There was an article on Cincy Jungle uh, right after that loss as far as how, how bad the Bengals have been outscored in the Marvin Lewis era in the second half. It, it was something ridiculous. It, it was like 100 to 10. I mean, it, it was pretty much that lopsided. So, um, you know, people that want to blame Dalton, it, it's just ignorance. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we've we talked about it so much on this show. Uh, I believe probably like 196 out of the 197 episodes we've done. That was even before he was a quarterback on this team. <laughs> but um, I think it's just uh, it's just tired journalism. It's it's June 1st when uh, when this was posted. It's off-season filler. Uh, need something to do, and sure, why not? It spurred a little debate and got a little uh, got the Bengals fans fired up. It's not all on Dalton. It's not all on the defense. It's it's a it's a joint effort by this team. Coaching, players, management, everybody has a hand in all these playoff failures. And guess what? They also have a hand in all the regular season success as well. And so, look, it's uh, it's tired journalism in my opinion, Scott. Yeah, it is, and and like I was saying before, as far as stupidity breeds breed stupidity. Just to give you an idea, you know, I had written an article this week about Terrell Pryor making the the roster, and I think he does. I think he makes it as a uh, a third quarterback. I got a tweet back from someone uh, today. This may give it away. His Twitter handle is awful white QBs, but he said that any anyone can throw lobs at AJ Green. Pryor's running skills make him a better option than McCarron or Dalton. I mean, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. If, you, if you've ever watched Terrell Pryor play and you think he compares it all to Andy Dalton, Andy Dalton, he who has 40 wins in the NFL, four playoff appearances and four tries, and Terrell Pryor who was uh, out of a job last year. I mean, that's the kind of stupidity that these articles breed. Good stuff, Scott. I'm glad you brought that up. Interesting tweet 
and Twitter handle as well uh, made me chuckle. I almost did a spit take there with my uh, my crystal light. <laughs> Good stuff, uh, as always. Look, look, we can sit here and beat a dead horse uh, about Andy Dalton, which we have plenty of time to do here this summer, coming up with training camp, all the OTA stuff, everything. Look, we've got plenty of time to bang on Dalton. <laughs> I want to switch gears and talk about some interesting news coming out of OTAs based on uh, some absences of some players. Marcus Hunt, for one, and Georgia Loca, another AC. Your, your thoughts on them not being at OTAs? Is this much to do about nothing? I think so. Uh, based on <laughs> based on Marvin Closed Lips Lewis, I mean, he, he talked about it the other day, and it was just, uh, they'll be fine, they'll be back, and they'll be ready for training camp. I mean, that's kind of all that he said about it. It's kind of Bill Belichickian, I guess, if you if you want to be uh, really specific about it. But I, I think Aloka, he's he's totally safe. I think he really latched onto that starting spot last year and played pretty well, um, along with a lot of the other players in the secondary, really, based on the lack of a pass rush up front. So uh, I think Aloka is fine. It, it's it's Hunt. I'm a little worried about. You know, I, he's always been a project player. He's uh, got every physical tool that you want, but doesn't seem to grasp the game, and that was kind of the knock on him coming out of the draft. You know, he's a project guy, and two, three years in, he still doesn't seem to get it, can't really fully stay healthy, and he's he's got another uh, issue going on now, and all of a sudden that defensive line, based on free agency and a couple of other things they've done, that defensive line's pretty crowded, and then you have Will Clark, the rookie from last year, apparently flashing in camp early on, and you sit here and you go, well, where where does Marcus Hunt fill in, uh, fit in? You know, and and there's other guys too, Devin Still and other these other guys. You know, how how are they going to make this roster unless they really get out on the field, get out on the practice field, and and make an impact? And that's the guy I'm a little worried about in terms of his future status. I mean, Aloka, I think I think that's going to be something that's going to heal up, and he's going to be fine. You're going to see him on this final roster, but Hunt's a little bit up in the air for me right now. Are you? And I want to get your take on this as well. I see. I mean, third round pick a year, uh, two years ago, I guess, was always a project, like you said. Is this a uh, is is Marcus Hunt right now in your eyes a bust? Are you asking me, Nick? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. He, I, I think actually he was a second round pick. Um, he was the second second round pick that year. Okay. Um, I don't think he's a bust, but I think this is the year that would determine if he's a bust or not. I think if if he can't. He's got this year to really show either, hey, this is a guy that at least we could use on a rotational basis or, or something like that um, and, and be a somewhat reliable guy. I mean, I, I would be excited if he's a backup player and still can get four, five, six sacks a year. At this point, he, he does not seem to be able to shed blockers very well, does not seem to be able to be grasping the game very well, um, and, and can't stay healthy. Uh, last Late last year, he was hurt, and then he's hurt again right now, so... Um, I'm a little worried about it, but I, I wouldn't call him a bust at this moment in time. I would say that this year probably determines that, though, in my book. Yeah, you were right. Second round pick, 53rd overall uh, for Marcus Hunt. Um, I, we kind of talked about this a little bit um, on the show last week, Mickey. Doc called in and, and was concerned about Marcus Hunt. Not at, not at OTAs now. Um, just kind of one of those names that we, we saw even in hard knocks. A lot of the players were thinking, wow, this – if he could get it together, he could be really good, but we just we just haven't seen it happen. Is he, in your eyes, going to make this roster come August? I think he will. And, uh, you know, if you think back to when we drafted him, everyone you know everyone kind of thought that was a reach at the time. Um, and then we had the, the window of hard knocks to kind of see what kind of physical freak this guy was. But we, but we can't forget how raw he was. Uh, he was kind of thrust into a role probably before he should have been when you know we lost Johnson to free agency. So I I don't know that I would necessarily call him a bust yet, but he's getting to that point where there's other guys around him on the roster that are stepping up, like you mentioned Clark, where missing things like this and then having a mediocre season or a mediocre camp will put him in a spot where you know he's replaceable and he couldn't falter, but. I don't put a lot of things. I don't put a lot of eggs in the basket for guys that maybe miss OTAs because who knows? Like there, I don't know that this is necessarily the case with him, but he could be working on some program with some elite trainers, you know, getting stronger, learn how to, you know, get get around the blockers, things like that. So 
I don't know. I don't. I, I think the guy is a, a a talent. Whether he puts it together, he's he's running out of time to do that. But I don't know that I necessarily expected much from him yet. So in your eyes, do you think maybe come August, Mickey, he's going to be on that roster bubble because they've got guys that they've they've drafted this year um, on the defensive line that they're you know they're going to need to consider keeping them around. They've also got some guys they drafted in the secondary that that's a potential roster spot. If he's not contributing. We're still waiting for him to contribute on special teams. I'm waiting for him to block a field goal. That was his thing, and we haven't seen it. Right. I think I think anyone that doesn't perform in camps on the on the bubble with the, with the the depth and talent at a lot of the positions on this team, I think you know no one outside of the, you know the elite guys' job is safe. So I think Hunt falls into that category, and I don't think that like I said, missing these OTAs are necessarily going to you know leverage that one way or the other. But his performance in camp will. Uh, so I, I hope that he comes and performs. You know, it makes the team stronger. But if he doesn't, he's definitely in trouble. I want to switch gears and talk about uh, Aloka a little bit more, Scott. Uh, you know, the Bengals, they drafted some some pretty good guys in the secondary at that safety position uh, this year. They also got uh, some pretty solid college free agents, if I'm not mistaken, there as well. Are, are you concerned that he – I know he's – I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he's heading into a contract year. Uh, Georgia Loka, um, is that correct? That's correct. So, is this a, a is this maybe a kind of a power play to say, hey, you know, sign me or extend me, or is this a this is a legit injury and I need to to rehab so that I'm ready for training camp kind of deal? Well, I mean, I don't think they they haven't said what the injury is, have they? I have not seen anything. No, I, I haven't seen anything. So, I mean, I'm gonna say it's a, a no story. I mean, you know, I I haven't heard anything that indicates it's anything serious you know missing OTAs is is no big deal to me I think uh, Ioka and Nelson are both free agents at the end of this year and I think they'll re-sign Ioka and let Nelson walk um, I think you know next year your starting safeties are Ioka um, and I actually I, I think it'll be that Darren Smith um, I think Sean Williams will get a shot but I think it'll be Darren Smith so I think Nelson's going to walk. I think they'll sign Iloka. Um, if not before this year, they'll sign him next year. Um, you know, to a solid deal. He's been a he's been a pretty good safety the last two years. So, I'd say no story. AC, do you have a take on that? I know you you've got a, a certain player out your way that you got your eye on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I, I think Iloka is in their their long term plans. If we've seen how the Bengals operate over the past few years, they those guys that are entering their final year or close to their final year in training camp, they usually get an extension done to keep some of their core players around. And I think they really like George Aloka. I mean, there's a lot to like of the kid. He's 6'3", 6'4", 220 pounds, and he's playing safety. He's got, you know, he's he can intercept the ball. He can play the run a little bit. So I think they're going to hang on to him. I don't think there's anything to him sitting out these OTAs. I think it's strictly injury. Um, I think, as as Scott mentioned, I think Darren Smith is probably one of those guys they look at as a safety. I think he was a steal in the sixth round this this last year, but I think they also have some high hopes for Josh Shaw, and, and whether that's a slot corner or as a safety, or maybe they maybe they kind of rotate guys in. You know, they like to do that on defense at really every level, um, aside from some of the cornerbacks. I mean, they really like to rotate guys in. And maybe they kind of do it by committee. That's not the ideal situation, but you know, if you've got a guy that has a certain set of strengths and another guy that's got a skill set that you'd like in certain packages, maybe that's what they do going forward. I really like Reggie Nelson. I admire the heck out of what he's done for this team since since he arrived in 2010. I, I do think he's getting on the downside of his career, and uh, you know, I I wouldn't mind seeing him sticking around for another year or two past his contract, but you got to be really cautious about that because some of those guys lose a step and uh, they, be, they could become a liability. Not saying he would be that, but you, you got to be cautious about that. Reggie Nelson, Mickey. I mean, he's done a lot of good things since coming over uh, in that trade with Jacksonville. Would you be sad to see him go, or do you think it's maybe that's just the way it's going to play out? I would be sad to see him go. Um I think Nelson's in a pretty good safety, and I think that we've seen him improve um, a little bit every season. So yeah, I'd be sad. I like, I kind of like what the Bengals have back there, but uh, you know, it's not a guy that I would necessarily overpay for. But I think he's a solid safety. If you could keep Reggie Nelson, extend him, 
What are your thoughts on Leon Hall sticking around? I know he's getting paid a lot of money for somebody not really producing either. It's not that he's not producing. Um, I think that Leon Hall is another guy that takes a lot of slack when he's a pretty solid corner and he's a smart corner. You know, he's not the fastest and he, he you know, he's not flashy, but he play, he he plays a pretty good position. Uh, but I do think his paycheck, you know, really cuts into what the Bengals can do with other players. So I do think there are some young corners on this roster that have the potential to step up and, and make Leon Hall expendable. So I I wouldn't be totally against that scenario, Nick. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts, Bengals fans. If you want to get in touch, the number to call, we'll open up the phone lines. 404-946-3397 is the number to call if you're outside the country as well. Inside the jungle is the Skype account. Get in touch. We'll, uh, we'll talk some Bengals here. we got about 30 minutes left here in the program. We'd love to hear from you if you're watching us live here at cincyjungle.com. We've got AC and Mickey both back this week. Last week, Scott and I, we talked about Marvin Jones being hurt yet again. <laughs> your your take on, on Mr. Jones, Anthony, being injured at the start of OTAs. I, I, to be fair, I have not seen if he is back practicing with the, with the offense, but uh, your thoughts on, on Mr. Marvin Jones? He was back Tuesday, actually, Nick. Great. Uh, yeah. That is and, good news. Yeah, it's very good news. And he actually, uh, from what I saw on social media, looked pretty good. Good good and bad news. One of the plays he, he looked very good on, he beat Drake Kirkpatrick on a long ball down the sidelines. So, oh, where's uh, John when you need him? Yeah, take that for what you will. But um, in, in interviewing, from what I read and saw, uh, in interviewing with the media after, he, he said he felt pretty good. It's... It's nice to be out there. Uh, he said it, it wasn't really a relief to be out there, but it was nice to, to be out there and cutting and going full speed. Uh, I think there was a little bit of caution there. I think he did tweak something probably in the offseason in his own workouts, and, and they were really taking it slow. I think probably last year they, they rushed him back, and you know he had, the, he had the foot surgery, and then they rushed him back. He probably overcompensated it and had the ankle deal. And I think they've they've learned a little bit from that, and they've they've kind of taken uh, a little bit of a hands off approach. And uh, he, from what I understand, he practiced Tuesday and, and looked very good. Um, and uh, he he is back. I, so I'm I'm excited about that. I think the Bengals should be excited about that. It's a big year for him, though. I mean, he kind of flashes at times, but he's got the injury history as well, which is a little scary if you're going to sign a guy long term. And he's one of those guys that is in line for a potential contract extension, and you'd like to see him here, but at the same time, you still want to see a little more from him too because he hasn't been on the field that often. So I like the player a lot, want to see more, but it's good to have him back so far. Mickey, I'm going to get your take on Marvin Jones uh, here in a minute. Let's go, though, to the phone lines. Area code 703. Hi, who's this? Hi, this is Richard Bolson. Hey, Richard, what's going on, man? Not much. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you guys. Uh, for the package I received, uh, someone might be listening, so I don't want to say more. But I, it was sent out to Hawaii. I really appreciate. Hey, very, very not much. a problem. Really excited about that. That's pretty cool. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really did. It was great. Um, and it's a really good shirt. I recommend everyone get one. So, <laughs> All right. Then. Um, I wanted to kind of my question tonight. I wanted to kind of continue. You guys have already kind of been hitting it, but. The Cincinnati Bengals had typically in the past extended two players if they're going to do any kind of extension. And um, I was wondering if, from your guys' perspective, who would the two players be that might get extensions this year? There's a bunch of guys, and it seems like the Bengals are at an interesting um, point. They have a lot of guys that are young, still uh, still proving something, and then they have a lot of veterans uh, that are ahead of those guys, like Reggie Nelson, Whitworth. And so I'm interested in where you guys think the Bengals will go with extensions this year. That is a tough call, Richard. I'm going to throw it to Scott first. Give me two names. For extensions this year, I would say... Um, first guys I'd look at would probably be George Iloka, a uh, guy we've already talked about, and then um, 
I don't think they're going to extend Green before this year. I think they'll wait that out. Um, you know, one of the receivers, Marvin Jones or Muhammad Sanu, it, it kind of seems to be the Bengals' mo. You got two guys at a position. They look to extend one of them, and the other guy leaves. You, you saw it before with uh, Dunlap and Michael Johnson. So I, I say they approach. I, I would venture to guess they sign Jones, but I would say one of the two they'll sign with an extension. The other guy is going to walk at the end of the year. So you're going with Aloka and Jones as yep. getting extensions this year. What about you, Mickey? I was trying to think when Scott was talking. I agree with the Aloka. You know, I think that's probably a solid one. But other than that, I don't know that. Do you really extend Jones for right now with? You know, the, the injury history, I, that's a tough one, man. I don't know about my second. Um, unless I'm missing an obvious one, I can't think of a second guy. Here's one I'm going to throw out, and, and maybe it's too soon because he kind of falls under that same category as Marvin Jones, but what about Drake Kirkpatrick? That's interesting. I mean, I don't know. Has he done enough to, to warrant that? I, that's a tough one, Nick. All right, so you're sticking with Aloka for sure, Mickey. How about you, yeah. XC? I, I think Kirkpatrick, like Zeitler, was, a, was had the fifth year option, uh, so he's he's going to be signed through 2016. So I think they're set there for a little bit. They're going to let him uh, play that out. So um, I, I I'm going to agree about Aloka. I think with AJ Green, I don't think a long term extension is going to be worked out. But I am going to bet the house that not my house, obviously, but I'm going to bet the <laughs> I'm going to bet the house that uh, they franchise tag A.J. Green. If we know anything about Mike Brown, he likes to throw money at at wide receivers. He did it with Carl Pickens. He did it with Chad Johnson a number of times. I, I don't know that they'll really come to an agreement this year on A.J. Green. I think he gets franchise tag next year because I don't think they want to get rid of him, especially if Andy Dalton's their guy next year. But I do think Aloka gets a long-term extension. And believe it or not, I think Andrew Whitworth gets a – I don't know if it's a long-term extension. I think maybe it's a two-year extension to play out the rest of his career as a Bengal. I think even though they drafted those two tackles, I don't think they're really willing to throw both of them out at the same time. I think maybe one – maybe as a project guy, see which guy can maybe play a little bit of guard. Um, and then they have a contingency plan with Whitworth there. Team captain, they love the guy, even though there was some drama there. I, I think it's uh, Whitworth and, and Aloka, if you're giving me two names right now, and then Green probably franchise tag down the road. Uh, just because I want to go against the boat, Richard, I'm going to go, I think they extend Marvin Jones, and I think they extend Mohamed Sanu. I think they extend both of them first. And I think I would not be shocked if the Bengals decide to pass on George Loca and let him walk. I, I that's just the way the way they drafted this year, and they the way they've drafted in years past. I I just would not be surprised if Aloka is uh, is gone after his contract is up. But that's just my take. Well, that's a cool take. The one guy that I would think is a dark horse is Adam Jones too. He's someone that I could see them doing, not a long term, but like a one or two year extension. They, they don't think that they want to like, like I, I think I think there is a chance just because of the size of Hall's contract that he might go before uh, Jones, and I think they could get Jones for a decent. And at the end of the year, you could argue he was the best cornerback, both understanding where he's to be on the field and physical physically. So, anyways. Thanks again, guys. Great show. Um, glad to have all of you back, and have a great night. All right. Hey, appreciate the call, Richard. Who day? Who day? Let's go to area code 443. Hi, who's this? Oh, this is Keith from Maryland. Man, I'm, I have not called up in a long time. How have you all been? We're doing good, Keenan. How are you? I'm doing okay. Just just a little depressed after that game, but uh, that last playoff game. You're just now but, uh, getting over I'm it, doing man. Good. Holy cow, yeah. that's a long time, Keenan. <laughs> well, um, my Cleveland Cavaliers are doing good. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. Final. <laughs> What's yeah. on your mind tonight, man? I I just want to call up, just say I think we're going to have a good year this year. I like I like the draft. We're go that means I think we're going to be running the ball heavy even more, and that's what I like. Well, I would hope so. I mean, you draft two tackles. Um, I don't know how much we'll see of them this year, but you're right. I think the fact that they saw what they had a year ago in Hill, 
I'd love to see Giovanni Bernard bounce back and have a huge year as well, but I'm pretty sure Hill's the guy moving forward uh, after what we saw a year ago. I could be wrong about that, though, Keenan. Yeah. Uh, who, I, I, and Andy Dalton, I think it, I think it's going to be a breakout year for him. I'm just, I'm just in a positive mood. All right, well, okay, so define breakout, because we've seen him have really good years. Mickey's giving you a thumbs up, by the way, Keenan. He, he's um, going to produce in the, play, in the playoffs. That's going to be his breakout. Wow, where's the bold prediction sound effect when I need it? <laughs> I'm uh, three, 300 yards, three touchdowns. <laughs> I'm calling it. No matter who they're playing, and we're huh? gonna beat the Steelers. We're gonna beat the Steelers at their home. I like it. I like positive Keenan tonight. He's uh, he's bringing it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to tell you all have a good night, though. Hey, appreciate the call, Keenan. Don't be a stranger. Uh, all right. Rude, that's Keenan giving us a ring from uh, from Maryland. He's over there in Ravens territory. Really sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah, I love that uh, AC. That's good. Good stuff, Mickey. I want to get uh, your thoughts on Marvin Jones being injured in uh, in OTAs and, and what it means moving forward for the Bengals and how important he's going to be for Andy Dalton. I think Marvin Jones has the potential to be the best receiver on this roster, and I think at times we've seen it and we've seen him carry the game. Um, you know, A.J. Green's an outstanding talent, but I think Jones is where he may have a leg up is is his effort at all times seems a little stronger than A.J. Green. You know, physically, A.J. Green can make every catch, and he does make some incredible catches. But, you know, Jones is the one that's going to lay out, and sometimes guys like that get hurt more uh, just because of the way they play. But uh, I think Jones healthy this season makes this team that much more, that much scarier. So I I hope he stays healthy, and I'm pretty, uh, you know, my fingers are crossed because I think, you know, his production would be huge this season. What, you know, what, you establish a running game, and then you have these weapons in the passing game. That could be tough to deal with. Yeah, you get Marvin Jones back healthy. You get a healthy Tyler Eifert back. There's a lot of good things I'm reading about Tyler Croft. Has anybody uh, come up with the Tyler Twins yet? I think I'm going to I'm gonna use that. Hashtag, you did that, AC? Good. All right. No, 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 no. no. I'll give you credit, man. You, you want to use it? Go for it. That's all you, man. It's all good. It's all good. I used it in a post or two, but Nick, I'm going to give you credit. It's all you, No, buddy. no, no, no. If you said it in your post first, that's all. AC, I'm, for the record, AC has come up with Tyler Twins. Let's do a joint patent. Joint right. patent on the thing. All right. All right. I like I it. I think Joe Reedy said it first. Oh, we had to go there. We did. Womp, womp, womp. And let's transition. Area code 269. Hi, who's this? Hey, what's up, fellas? This is Doc Ox. How are you guys tonight? Doc, what's up, buddy? Hey, it's good to see you guys back together as a team again. I know. It's, uh, it's like we're all coming back from the injured list, and uh, if only Andy Dalton could throw to us, right? Oh, you got it. You got it. So I uh, wanted to follow up. Actually, it's about the uh, the Tyler twins that you guys were just talking about. And uh, I was thinking about the uh, the position groups uh, and trying to figure out which one is what I would say is the most fragile. In other words, if somebody goes down, a starter goes down, where are we hurting the most? Where should we be the most scared? And I mean, everything points to tight end. I, I've got to admit that I'm concerned that you know, if I forgets hurt and you got to admit it, the football gods haven't been smiling down upon him with, you know, with respect to injuries. So you go, you got Croft, who's obviously unproven. Uzuma, I guess Hewitt has potential. We saw a lot of good potential out of him, especially as an undrafted free agent last year. But what do we really have behind that? I wanted to get your take on what the most fragile position group is and, you know, see if you agree that maybe tight end would be it. I am going to disagree with you, Doc, about tight end. The one area that I am absolutely concerned about and scared to death about, anybody getting injured, wide receiver. That's the one group, if A.J. Green gets hurt, if Marvin Jones gets hurt, either we saw what happened with A.J. Green just by himself last year. It, it was a struggle offensively. And, yeah, I know we changed the focus to running the football a lot more, but, I mean, A.J. Green, we haven't seen him stay completely healthy recently either so for me it's receiver AC how about you since he brought up your Tyler twins if we're talking team wide I'm actually going to go linebacker um I, I Vontez perfect is nursing that really bad uh surgery the micro fracture surgery uh they drafted uh Paul Dawson which I who I do like 
Ray Maluga has his ups and downs, and you know you've got Emmanuel Lemur who who has has had his ups and downs. Vinny Ray, you know, he's kind of a fringe starter backup guy. So I look there. I do agree with you a little bit on the wide receiver thing there, Nick. But uh, I think they're a little bit more well equipped this year if some of the young guys end up taking bigger strides than some people expect them to. But definitely wide receiver and linebacker groups to watch. How could I forget? I mean, the Bengals have age, uh, Brandon Tate on the on the right wide receiver court, so they're good. They're golden here for uh, 2015. <laughs> Kurt in the chat room, uh, uh, Airport Kurt, as we now call him, <laughs> he's saying linebacker, Doc. Mickey, how about you? If, if there's one group, position group, that you're absolutely concerned about if somebody gets hurt, where, uh, where are you looking? So if I'm understanding this question right, a position group where one person gets hurt, and I, you know, Nick, you say wide receiver, and I understand if A.J. Green gets hurt, we've lost – a significant player, but you know you have Marvin Jones and Sanu. You've got your, you still got. Um, well, we saw it a year ago with Marvin Jones getting hurt. How much that affected them, and off, also we didn't have Tyler Eifert either. So that's that played into it as well. Right. I mean, we're going multiple, and we, you know, we weren't our 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 running game wasn't established until later in the season. You know, uh, you know, so all those went into it. I would say, you know, linebackers up there, but I mean. This is just going to solidify what everyone thinks. But if our quarterback goes down, we're screwed. Like, who <laughs> good do, point. <laughs> who, who do we really have behind Dalton that has any NFL experience? I, I mean, th- there's very little. Are, are we really ready to have McCarron lead this team or or, or Pryor? Or, I mean, the, so I would argue that that's our number one. But um, beyond that, I think linebacker is huge because – you know, we're already holding our breath to see what happens with Perfect. Um, and, it, you know, A.J. Hawk's here, but he's not a long-term fix. So that, I would say, you know, beyond the quarterback, which I think, I think we'd all probably agree that that would be the most devastating to this season. Uh, probably linebacker's the, the smart pick. Yeah, that's a good call. I mean, we take for granted, as much as we bang on Dalton, guys, he's durable. I think he's missed one half of football in his NFL career from for, due to an injury. If I'm not mistaken, and it was his, his first, first regular game. season game. Exactly. Yep. So we take that's that's a good call, Mickey. How about you, Scott? Mickey, I think you forgot about my guy off the white QBs. You know, anyone can throw the ball up to AJ Green, and the Bengals be way better with your boy Terrell Pryor and his running skills. So I, I you know, I, I think they'd be all set. In fact, they might find a new starting quarterback if Dalton goes down. Um, no, I, obviously I'm kidding. I, I actually hadn't thought about quarterback. Mickey's absolutely right. If if Dalton goes down, <laughs> people are going to laugh, but the Bengals are screwed. Uh, so I'll go outside of quarterback, and I think it's definitely linebacker. Uh, you've already got questions there to begin with. I think you saw what happened with the defense last year when they started having problems. That's why they signed A.J. Hawk. But like Mickey said, uh, one, he's not a long-term answer. Two, you're not quite sure what he's got left in the tank either. So to, to put all of your eggs in his basket, you know, it, it, that's a little risky as well. So I'd say linebacker, you know, from a wide receiver and tight end standpoint, it would hurt. But you can scheme around those positions, i.e. if you lose a wide receiver, use the tight ends more, run the ball more, etc. So um, I'd say linebacker. You know, when it comes to quarterback, you guys are all forgetting we've got the poor man's Cam Newton on our roster now. Bandy Dalton goes down. We've got the Terrell Pryor, Doc. And the next Tom Brady and A.J. McCarron. That's right. <laughs> right. Okay. Good question, though, Doc. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot for taking my call, and all of you guys chime in. That was good to hear. And, uh, Nick, I'm glad I could set it up on a tee for you so you could get another jab at uh, Brandon Tate. Uh, so glad I could help you out there. Love me some Brandon Tate. Hey, appreciate the call, Doc. Have a good yeah. weekend, buddy. Yeah. Have, yeah, you do, you guys do the same. Who day? Who day? That's Doc Ox giving us a ring here on uh, Inside the Jungle. Good stuff. Good question. Uh, I, gosh, I, I'm really worried, though, if the wide receivers, if anybody gets hurt, coupled with the, you know a loss on the, the, the tight end group, man, that, that, that did not go well for us a year ago. Um, good, good calls. Appreciate everybody getting in touch with us here on the program. How about we do some shout-outs, shall we? Shout-outs. You need to learn how to adjust the volume on that thing. Shout-outs. Mickey, it's been a while. Give us a shout-out this week. I'm going to shout-out Mr. Nick Suberling and Mr. Scott Bantel for holding down the show last week. You guys did a great job for your, your two-man crew, so uh, I just wanted to you know show my respect for what you guys laid down. 
good stuff. Appreciate that. It was a fun show, Scott. How about you? Give us a shout out this week. Well, I'm going to return it back and give it to Mickey. Uh, I'd like to thank the one and only uh, Mickey for gracing us with his presence tonight. Be sad <laughs> that he what won't is going be on here? What what is up with this? Sad that he won't be here the next five weeks as he travels the world, uh, <laughs> establishing world peace and uh, conquering ISIS all at the same time. So, um, my shout outs to Mickey. All right. Okay. How about you, AC? Give us something good. Not do that I those two are great, aren't, aren't great shout outs, but give us something good here. Do I need to shout out myself? Because there was like a glaring omission from both of their shout outs, and it was me. So I, I, I don't know if I need to shout out myself or whatever, but I will not because I'm not that narcissistic. Um, I'm going to shout out a guy named Dan Waite. Uh, his Twitter handle is at DNKW. He submitted a Twitter question um, for the mailbag that's going to go up, I believe, to, uh, on Thursday on Cincy Jungle. So shout out to him. I'm going to shout out the Seattle Mariners manager, Lloyd McClendon, who if you have not seen his freakout session from earlier this week on umpires, it is absolutely epic. And I'm going to actually shout out the man, the myth, the legend, Neil Diamond. I went and saw him in concert about a week and a half ago. I was easily the youngest person there, aside from my wife, by about two decades, but he still rocked it. He's about 71 or 72 years old. Still sounded awesome. And those are my shout-outs, and I'll shout-out me too. Bye. <laughs> Good shout-outs. One, Lloyd McClendon, not his first go-around with the crazy umpire tirade. Uh, he's, he's had a few. Two, uh, for those of you who are watching the video podcast of Inside the Jungle now, you can see that Anthony is sporting the Neil Diamond tee, and uh, yeah, good stuff there. Neil Diamond, you can't go wrong, man. Sweet Caroline coming to America, good stuff. Good shout-outs this week. I, I have no shout-outs this week because we have no new patrons on our Patreon campaign. Uh, if you want to help us out and support Inside the Jungle, um, we are a video podcast now, and your support on Patreon helps uh, pay for the bandwidth for the video podcast, so... Uh, SPNT.tv slash Patreon is a way to help us out and contribute to our Patreon campaign. And we thank uh, all of those who have contributed to that campaign over the last year or so. It's really been uh, really been helpful and uh, can't thank you enough for your support. One more time, let's go to the jungle line before we get out of here. Area code 828. Hi, who's this? Hey, Nick. It's Kurt from Asheville, North Carolina. It's Airport Kurt from Asheville, North Carolina. What's <laughs> up, man? How you been? Good. How are you guys? I'm doing well. Is your school year over? Uh, no, we have, uh, end grade test this week, and then, uh, the 11th is our last day, and the 12th is my birthday, so that's, that'll be a nice birthday present oh. to me, having, having my kids go home for the summer. Very cool. Happy birthday. Happy early birthday. My birthday is Saturday, as well as Larry Rolson. Aloha, Larry. His birthday is on Saturday as well. Happy birthday, Larry. Mm -hmm. And happy birthday to you, Kurt. Well, thank you. And, and I have to shout out AC really quick. I, I know I'm, I'm not, I don't get one, but I feel bad for the guy, so I'm going to shout you out, AC. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> Thanks, well Kurt. Appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. What's on your mind tonight? Hey, listen, I, 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 I read something earlier this week when they were interviewing Jeremy Hill, and he was saying about how next year he's really happy to have Bernard back full strength, and he thinks that that Hughes in the offense is going to have is going to have them split fifty fifty. How how realistic do you think that is of uh, that Hughes actually going to split them fifty fifty between carries? And I guess the second part of it is, would you rather them splitting fifty fifty, or do you think you'd rather see Jeremy Hill take the bulk of the carries? Oh, I cannot stand the fifty fifty thing personally. I didn't like it when they were doing it with Ben Jarvis, Green, Ellis, and Bernard. Um, I I would much rather them give the rock more to to Jeremy Hill personally, but that's just my take. Uh, AC, I'll start with you. Uh, what are your thoughts? I I don't think it'll be fifty fifty as much as Hugh says it might be. I think it'll probably be more sixty forty, sixty five, thirty five in terms of being in favor of Hill. Um, I, I am in favor of them being there being a splitting of touches or carries simply from the the standpoint of uh, overall health because that position really takes a beating. I mean that we've seen it. You know, there's there are some players that get three four years in and they you know all of a sudden their effectiveness really 
uh, drops because of the amount of touches they've had. And I, I think both guys bring a completely different skill set. So I'm in favor of them splitting carries. I don't think it needs to be even, especially because of the success you saw when the Bengals really fed the ball to Hill at the end of the year. Um, I, I do think, uh, to that point, I do think that you're going to see Hill get more carries as the year progresses because the weather gets worse. They're going to want to run the ball more, and in some of these venues they're going to play at the end of the year, you know, it's, it's going to, you're going to need to run the football. So um, I don't think it's going to be a true 50-50, but I, I do think there's going to, you're going to see a lot of both guys. How about you, Mick? I don't think you can listen to what any coach says, especially at this time of year. Um, you know, no one's going to tip their hand. So, uh, you know, maybe it is ends up at the end of the season being 50-50 on touches, not necessarily carries. Uh, I'd love to see a spot where they're both in the backfield and you have the threat to run, threat to swing out and catch a pass, things like that. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, I don't put a lot of faith in that. I think – Jeremy Hill's going to be our running back, you know, hitting the rock. If if I had to draft my fantasy roster today, he'd be the one I'd choose over Bernard. I agree with you 100%, Mick. How about you, Scott? Yeah, I think it'll be more tilted to it, towards Hill, maybe 60-40 type split. Um, but I, I think Hill's going to serve a, a big purpose more so in the passing game, and I agree with Mickey. I think the one thing we all wanted to see last year that we didn't was Hill and Bernard in the backfield at the same time. And I don't know why we didn't see it more, but I'm hoping this year, especially with, with two healthy tight ends, that you're going to see that more. There's your answer, Kurt. I like it. I'd love to see them. I mean, I know we got Dane Sonsenbacher as kind of like a slot receiver, and Sanu's our big guy, but um, I really like to see some of those sets where they push where they push Bernard out wide like into like more of a slot play so they can do a quick out and you know, it's like kind of like a quick slant in, or they can pitch it out to him. But I think that he could be used as a really good like slot receiver in in certain formations. So I I agree. Like it's probably going to be like 65, 35, like you guys said. But I'd love to see you know Bernard getting a bunch of touches as far as like in the passing game goes, getting in some space, kind of like an Andrew Hawkins type of guy. We would all love that, Kurt. But we know how how that goes over with the Bengals offense. And 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 to you, Nick, I think that you'll be happy to know that I bet Mario Alford's going to be taking some of those punt returns from Tate. We can we can count on Bernard getting that kick return, right? Book it, Brandon Tate, day one. He's starting. <laughs> I'm telling you, book it right now. He's going to be. I want to let you know your, your Tate your Tate jersey is in the mail on its way to your house. Nick. Awesome. I, I I don't want to ruin your birthday present, but it'll be there any day now. I will hang it proudly <laughs> here in the in, inside the Jungle Studios. <laughs> Thanks for taking my call, gentlemen. Have a good evening. Who day? You too, Kurt. Have a good one. That's uh, Kurt finishing things up here on the Jungle Line here on uh, Inside the Jungle. Good stuff as always. I actually saw something today, guys, that Rex Burkett has taken a lot of snaps out at the, the split receiver position there, which we saw there in the playoffs. Good for him. I mean, that's if you got to do what you got to do to make the roster and, and make an impact. And right now, we, we have not seen a whole lot of Rex Burkhead. Oh, uh, I believe in the two years that we have uh, have had him on this roster, so good for him. Uh, seeing if he can make an impact there, out wide for the Bengals. It's time to get out of here. Final thoughts. I kind of did something. Uh, what was it last week or two weeks ago? We did we did something about um. Uh, what did we call? Oh yeah, we were ripping off Dan Patrick, calling it. Uh, what did we learn? Right, Scott. What did we learn this week here on Inside the Jungle? That was what we did, and I learned that uh, Anthony has to beg for his shout-outs. <laughs> the, the rest of us, they just, they just come naturally. Good stuff. I like it. What did you learn this week, Mick? I learned something about Anthony, too. I learned that he loves Neil Diamond as much as I love Andy Dalton. <laughs> what did you learn this week, a uh, AC? Well, I'm going to class this up a little bit because I've, I've become the target here, but I learned that as if I didn't really know already, but some severe illnesses are tough to get rid of, and when you think you're in the clear, you're not, and I'm referring to Leah Still. Um, you know, thoughts and prayers out to her. Uh, you know, she, she got past some certain things, had kind of a little uh, relapse on some certain things, so, um, you know, it sounds like that's kind of a still a tumultuous deal, even though things looked like they're in the clear, so... Thoughts and prayers out to her, and I hope you guys feel guilty because I did a really 
serious one, and you guys didn't. Golf clap for AC. What did I learn this week, Scott? Well, Crickets. well, you learned you learned that I still can't operate my mute button. <laughs> um, and I think I think we learned that uh, people are starting to pick up your love for Brandon Tate. And I I would venture to guess by the end of this season that you'll probably have a, a Brandon Tate jersey or T-shirt or or some other paraphernalia from Tate in your. Uh, in your studio downstairs. Bring it on. I would love to see it. I would love to have it. Uh, <laughs> that's what we learned this week. We want to know what you learned this week because of Inside the Jungle. Email us, inside the jungle at spnt.tv. Just a reminder, Inside the Jungle is recorded live every Wednesday night, 8 o'clock Eastern here at cincyjungle.com. But don't worry, if you can't make the live show, you can always download the show in our podcast format. So there's an audio version there's an HD video version as well as a, an SD video version in iTunes. Um, so if you want to subscribe, you can get it there or wherever you uh, subscribe to podcasts as well. In the coming weeks, we will be updating you on the new Inside the Jungle app, which will be launching here in a couple weeks on both the Android platform and the iOS platform. That's, uh, that's coming down the pipe, hopefully by episode 200, which is just a few weeks. Or Mickey, are you going to be back for episode 200? Which, where are we at? Oh, that would be, we're at 197 this week. The next two, 198, 199. That would be my return. All right. We are looking forward to having you back for episode 200 in a couple weeks. Uh, As always, gentlemen, appreciate uh, all you do for the show and uh, for being with us this week as well. Don't forget, uh, again, help us out. Patreon, spnt.tv slash Patreon. It's a, uh, the show is supported by you and we really appreciate all the support uh, that you give us as well. Inside the Jungle is an SPNT production. For more information about our other podcasts, podcasts, make sure you log on to spnt.tv. Check out our amazing Bengals content over at cincyjungle.com as well. And I have to thank our awesome associate producers. They help out the show tremendously. Andy Lanham, Larry Rolson, Mike Vardy, and Fado by Ari. So for AC, Mickey, Scott, I'm Subes. We will see you next Wednesday for another edition of Inside the Jungle. Hootay, everybody! <laughs>